Hello and welcome to Economic Forum, a program where we discuss various issues affecting our economy in Zimbabwe. These are various issues in life that include agriculture, manufacturing, public relations, religion, education, everything we discuss here. But what we focus on is the economic impact. What impact do they bring uh, to our economic or business uh, uh, environment? My name is John Masu. Oftentimes, when you are looking at uh, CVs, uh, curriculum vitae, you see uh, a lot written about someone's qualifications uh, that I hold this certificate, diploma, degree, and so forth. But you also see some way where a person says, I am organized, I am kind, I am time conscious, and so forth. Those, you know, the second lot, are what we call soft skills. The first ones are hard skills. But the soft skills at times are difficult to measure by yourself where you can say, I am kind, I am uh, time conscious, I know time management and so forth. And this is what we want to discuss today with our guest, Nyari Pervis, who is a human capital specialist. Nyari, welcome to Economic Forum. Thank you, John. Yes. Thank you very much. Soft skills. Uh, here I am, I'm looking for a job, John Nasuhu, BSc, this and that, diploma, and this and that, masters, and this and that, kind and well organized and well motivated. Tell us about John's soft skills. And, uh, are they natural? Was he trained? How do they come about? So, the first thing that I would like to point out, John, is that portion of your CV, the portion that says objectives. The portion where you outline the fact that you're kind, you're time conscious, you're punctual, you're self-motivated. I call that portion the copy and paste portion. Because usually, people don't even pay attention to what they're writing in that little block. It's usually about maybe six sentences long, about so long. Or six points. Six points. And literally... They don't even pay attention to what they're saying. That same person who's saying I'm punctual, time conscious, I manage my time very well, will show up 30 minutes late for an interview. So soft skills are not something that companies should discard. Um, they're not something that companies should um, put on the side burner to merely concentrate on the hard skills. So before we get into that, um, let me just start off by explaining what um, a hard skill is, or rather giving you an example of a hard skill. So if I decide that I want to become a medical doctor or a surgeon, for instance, I will go to medical school and I will learn the hard skill of being a surgeon. When I come out of it after however many years, I have a certificate or a diploma or a degree that says I'm able to perform a surgery. A soft skill on the other hand is not something that I can go to school for and um, walk out with a piece of paper that certifies me in terms of um, those, those aspects. So for example, um, if I say somebody is a great problem solver, they don't teach that in schools. And you can't because you, you, what would the syllabus look like if they tried to put in every single problem known to man and then try and teach us how to solve those problems? So some of these things come naturally. Um, some people are born leaders. Some people are born great communicators. Uh, my mother often said that um, a lot of my reports in primary school especially said, you know, Nyahato is a very talkative person. That's how I was born. My younger sister, on the other hand, is an introvert very quiet, has never had a report that says she has opened her mouth out of turn. Um, and yet, she's a great speaker, she's a great communicator. As a matter of fact, um, she's the head of communications at the firm that she works at. The reason being, she was surrounded by people who communicated expressively, easily, comfortably, clearly, concisely. And so it's something that she learned um, due to her environment, and it's something that she then developed into soft skill. Let's finish off with the issue of CVs. You just want to do a short critique about how we write our CVs, in particular how we you know, relate to our soft skills which you say it is a cut and paste. Mm -hmm. uh, are they the same as core competencies? Because when you see a job advert, mm -hmm. it advertises for the hard skills mm -hmm. and then it says as far as 
core competencies are concerned, these are the ones. Are they the same as soft skills? So, uh, core competencies are um, your capabilities, the amount of knowledge that you've accrued over time, your skills, um, any resources that... Related um, to your art. Exactly. So, those you can almost measure. Because if I'm talking to you and I'm interviewing you, I can see how much knowledge you have mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what you do for a living. Whereas, if we're sitting here and, and I'm conducting a 45 minute interview, what you've written on your CV versus who you are may not um, match up. For example, let's say you write on your CV, um, one of your core competencies is your ability to research and use your resources effectively. That's something that we can measure once you're on your job, even during the probationary period. Um, by giving you certain tasks to see if you're able to, to execute. In terms of a soft skill, on the other hand, whatever you've written on your CV, if you were to give your CV to, say, a parent or a spouse or a child or a close friend, and you were to ask them to read that copy and paste portion of your CV, sometimes there's a mismatch. You, there's, a mismatch. Yeah. there's a huge disconnect. Um, you might find you've written, for example, you're good at problem solving and you can work well under pressure. But your spouse will then say, mm, you panic, actually, <laughs> under pressure. I'm not saying write that on your CV. Um, I'm just saying for uh, on the employer's side, let's try and maybe take that portion of a CV with a little bit of a grain of salt and try and measure it throughout the 90-day probation to qualify whether or not that is accurate. That's Nyari Pevis, who is our guest today. We are talking about soft skills. Oftentimes, when we are looking for jobs, we present our hard skills, uh, which are our qualifications, our certificates, our diplomas, and so forth. But there are also those soft skills, like time management, like kindness, like problem solving, which we don't have certificates in, that we also say we are. And in, in many cases, others just copy-paste them without thinking very seriously about them. So join us in the second segment of Economic Forum, where we continue to describe and give examples of soft skills. We are now in the second segment of Economic Forum, where today we are discussing soft skills. Those are the skills that uh, our guest Nyari Pevis here says it's not easy to measure them, but they're very important at your workplace, and you can acquire them from home, you can acquire them from your experience elsewhere. You may leave home without them, go to another country and come back with new skills, that is, uh, you come back being kinder than what you were, uh, being more organized than what you were, and so forth, which means that you've acquired some soft skills. But there's one thing, Nyari, that happens in the world of employment when we look at hard skills as well as soft skills, whereby uh, there are so many people who are obtaining many A's, 20 A's, 30 A's, and so forth. But when they come for job interviews, some of us have interviewed people for jobs and so forth, they can't even speak properly, they cannot even write their CV properly, they cannot even write a motivational letter and so forth. So talk about that with regards to hard skills in relation to soft skills. Okay. Um, so I think it's important for us to <clears throat> determine that we are not, we're not knocking the hard skills, we're not knocking technical ability. Someone you may have two students, for example, who um, go to university together and one is a straight A student and the other one struggled to get by but passed all the same. Both of them um, will end up sitting across the, the, the desk from me during an interview based on, and I would have called them in based on what their CV looks like. So for instance, a graduate trainee will walk in and I can see that on their CV they've got She's a straight-A student, she's done very well, top of her class, and then she sits across from me and 
can hear what she's saying. Um, a number of times I've had to ask, please speak up. You are sitting in a room fighting for a job that 4,000 other people have applied for and you cannot express yourself. You cannot sell yourself. You cannot sell yourself. So that is a massive disconnect that especially our young graduates need to um, start to pay attention to and work on. Um, another example, we're looking at two uh, employees that work in the same department. Uh, one is shooting the lights out, for example. Let's take accounting, for, for example, because it's very easy to, to measure productivity in accounting. Um, you have an individual who is um, collecting at a rate of 99%. The young man sitting next to her is collecting at a rate of 80%. We are now faced with a situation where we want to promote somebody into a leadership position. Most organizations make the mistake of picking the one with the high productivity or the one who's um, shooting the lights out because we feel like, okay, they might lead by example and now everybody will fall into place. Meanwhile, what may have happened here is the young man who's collecting at 85% actually has natural born leadership skills and won't be um, difficult to train and mentor into a leadership um, position. So... Once we take a look at a 360 degree view of an individual, all of their hard skills, how are they performing at work, how punctual are they, they've checked all the boxes. We now need to look for things like attitude. Uh, we now need to look for things like self-motivation. I may be collecting at 99%, but I've got, I'm not motivated to grow personally, which means I'm not motivated to grow in my position at work. So those are other elements that we, as, as management or as leadership, need to take into account. Do managers or does management understand you know, these skills, uh, hard skills, soft skills, and the core competence that we talked about? Because that, that is where the problem might arise. Because these are the people who are going to decide on hiring a CEO mm. or, or a managing director. Mm. Yet they them, or the board, mm -hmm. yet they themselves, you know, don't even know. You know, they, they are just looking at a personality that so-and-so is very friendly. Mm. They phone them at night to tell them what they were doing and so forth and so forth. Some actually, you know, uh, sort of for campaign for promotions and so forth. But uh, the good hires would see whether they are competent or not, despite all the favors that they, they might uh, carry them with. So I think to answer your question, do they know? Yes, they are aware of this. The, um, all of them? The majority of them, yes. But I think they tend to overlook the soft skills because it's, it's easier for me to justify uh, promoting Bill based on his productivity. If I now come to you as my director and I try and sell Sally to you, you might look at Sally's um, productivity and say, eh, you know, and now it becomes a negotiation. So I think a lot of times it's just easier to present the shining gold star um, rather than try and explain why you want to promote someone who's producing quote unquote less. Nyari, we've been talking about uh, a lot of these soft skills in your examples, but let's list more of them so that uh, the viewers fully understand what we're talking about uh, when we refer to these soft skills. I think the top on my list will always be leadership uh, because when I'm hiring somebody, I'm hiring someone with the view of uh, hopefully building and nurturing them into uh, a leadership position. So leadership, uh, communication, effective communication, um, interpersonal skills. And by communication, you're saying, despite the fact that uh, James has got a, a degree in communication, he may not be a good communicator. But someone else, uh, maybe with a, a degree in science, may even be ahead when uh, communicating at the workplace. Absolutely. And communication is also split between verbal and nonverbal. Mm -hmm. I may be a talker, but if you put me in front of a laptop and ask me to send a letter to the president of whatever country, now I'm stuck uh, because my communication skills um, sort of stop there. Um, Self-motivation and work ethic um, is a huge one. You know, what, what, what is a person doing when no one else is watching? Are they, are they actually pushing what they're supposed to be doing? Uh, teamwork, problem solving. 
Adaptability is a big one. What happened during COVID? Mm -hmm. We all had to be flexible and adapt to a new way of doing business. So somebody who is not, who does not have the ability to, and the flexibility to adapt, wouldn't have survived working in a lot of these corporates. A lot of people actually didn't survive. Nyari Pevis, who is a human a capital specialist, we're talking about soft skills here, those skills which are beyond hard skills, our certificates, our degrees and so forth, but which also help us at work, especially when we relate to other people, when we relate to outsiders, which again contributes a lot to our work environment. So join us in the third and final segment of Economic Forum. We are now in the third and final segment of Economic Forum, where today we are discussing soft skills with Nyari Pevis. Nyari is a human capital specialist and also she's into events, but all that needs proper management. Mm -hmm. And that's why soft skills are very, very important. Nyari, uh, how about the organization? When you're looking at the organization, it might be uh, an organization of professionals, all you know, beyond certificate level and so forth. But there can be something about behavior. There can be something about the culture of an organization that you may not like. And uh, that might lead to your questioning of their soft skills. Talk about that. So, John, we recently um, traveled to Silicon Valley. And we visited... Silicon Valley is in America. Yes, in San Francisco. Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, and we had the privilege and opportunity to visit s some of the top Forbes-listed organizations um, in the world. Uh, two of them are amongst the top ten. And the one thing that struck us about, especially the top two, was they had a very healthy and thriving organizational culture. Your company can be full of extremely intelligent, highly certified leadership, but the impact of the soft skills on its success is massive. Organizational culture can literally mean, it can cost you. It can cost an organization tens of thousands of dollars through high turnover. When someone is hired this month and, and next month, three months, months I always joke about um, a young man who stands at, on the 10th floor of a building while new hires are coming for their interviews and he's holding this massive board that says, don't do it, run for your life. You don't want that type of culture. And a lot of times it's not coming from people because they're not, they're not able to do their jobs. It's not coming from people who are not qualified to do their jobs. It's stemming from bad attitudes, stemming from um, individuals not being able to work together, it's stemming from people not being able to diplomatically put their points across where I have a situation where, John, this is a win-lose situation. I don't want to hear what you have to contribute to what we're talking about, my way or the highway, because I'm right. When we're talking about such things, especially in an organization, the topics or the soft skills that immediately come to mind are adaptability, which you have already talked about and you gave the example of the COVID-19 era where organizations had to adapt. Those which didn't actually crumbled. Yes. I, I know quite a number of organizations in the media which crumbled because they couldn't think beyond what they used to do in the past. And there's another you know, topical topic nowadays which is critical thinking, where you have to think beyond or outside the box, and emotional intelligence. I want you, Nyari, uh, to talk about uh, those critical uh, skills or those soft skills with regards to what we're saying about the organizational culture and your experience when you visited uh, Silicon Valley with uh, uh, some managers some time ago. So, um, just to be clear, we're not saying that, um, you know, the organizations that we visited are, you are, the know, best. are the best and you know nobody there's no conflict and everybody gets along um, the point is how do we resolve conflict when it does arise 
the question is when COVID hit, who actually sat down and said, okay, there's a pandemic on our hands. What are we doing about it? Or did we all just start running around panicking and sort of trying to figure out what is the, the nation's leadership going to say? How do we, how do we move forward from here? So that's where some of these soft skills start to sort of come into play. You are looking at um, leadership that can sit down and very calmly say, this is what we're faced with. How are we going to get around it? How are we going to navigate it? How are we going to survive it? Um, and in terms of conflict resolution, are you speaking in a diplomatic tone? Are you able to hear all the parties out? Are you able to make an objective um, decision based on facts uh, as opposed to I like John better than I like Bill and so I'm just going to go with what he says. So a lot of those factors come into play and at the end of the day again, these are not things that are taught at school. But while they are not taught Yari, as we wind up our program, I think it's important uh, just to revisit the home, the school, the church and other institutions and give advice to those who lead uh, so that they can also nurture a, a culture of soft skills development. So I think it's very, very important for leadership to take it upon themselves to um, work on these. Um, there are a lot of articles that have been written. Uh, one of my favorite resources is the Harvard Business Review um, and LinkedIn. Pull up articles and just start taking a look at how larger organizations are dealing with um, their organizations in respect, in regards to soft skills and start to look within and see which of those soft skills you as a leader um, are strong at and which ones you have to work at. Because like we said um, over and over again through this pro throughout this program, all of these can be developed. Every single one of them can be developed. So if you can develop your own soft skills, it'll be easier for you to then assist um, in developing them in the people that work in your teams. Nyari Pevis, I'd like to thank you very much for coming to Economic Forum. That's Nyari Pevis, our human capital specialist, who has been talking to us about soft skills. We know about hard skills which come from certification, from diplomas, from degrees, and so forth. But there are also those soft skills that we've mentioned, like problem solving, time management, self-motivation, and so forth, which we often write on our CVs, not thinking very deeply about them, only to be told when we're at the workplace that you wrote this on your CV, but that's not what you are doing. If you'd like to get in touch with us about this program and others and even suggestions, you can do so on the numbers that are showing on your screen. If you would like to engage with us, you can also do that on the social media platforms that are also showing on your screen. If you have missed some of the episodes of Economic Forum, you can view them on our YouTube channel, which is Economic Forum Zimbabwe. So on behalf of Nyari Pevis, who is a human capital specialist, as well as the production crew of Economic Forum, this is John Masugu wishing you happy viewing.